Thursday evening, everybody. This is the Porch. It is a VolQuest.com baseball podcast. I'm your host, Eric Kane. Uh, the man of the hour, Luke Lipsius, former Tennessee first baseman and home run champion for maybe just a couple of days. Uh, he can still say that he'll be coming up here in a matter of about 10 minutes or so. Big shout out to our friends over at Spivey King and Spivey LLP for making this podcast coverage possible here on the porch as Tennessee gets ready to go against Ole Miss this weekend. Matthew A. Spivey, J. Matt King, Richard A. Spivey, they are Tennessee fans just like you, and they can serve a huge purpose if you have a need down the line. Because if you have a problem, they can find a solution for you. TN Trial Lawyers, specializing in family law, personal injury, and criminal defense. 865, excuse me, 423 245 4185 for a free consultation or visit them online at Spivey King and Spivey LLP.com. If you have a need, check out our friends over at Spivey King and Spivey LLP. All right. We have got uh, some things to get into here today. And Tennessee's getting ready to come back home. It's already home, play a home game on Tuesday. It's going to host Ole Miss. Ole Miss coming off a series victory against South Carolina, number 20, I believe, at the time, South Carolina. Um, last weekend, and it's a series that Tennessee needs to get, no doubt about it. Um, I, I think I said this on the Mailbag podcast, and I mean no disrespect to, um, I mean no disrespect to to Ole Miss because I think it's a, a solid group and it's off to a good start. But this is one of those series that you you need to go ahead and take care of business with. I'm not saying you got to go out there and sweep them, but you need to win this series at least two games to one. And really, next weekend when you host Georgia. You need to win that series as well because look what's coming up down the line. Of course, you still have series against uh, Vanderbilt, against Florida, um, LSU, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's the grind of the Southeastern Conference. So you need to take advantage of series like this, which I think are good and respectable teams, but you're better than these teams. And we'll get into that in here in a little bit of a moment and tell you what comprises Ole Miss uh, in this baseball squad coming up this year. Real quick, let's look back on the Alabama series. Again, I wrote about it. I know it was about a week ago now, so there's not sent, no reason to spend a whole lot of time on it. But I think the biggest difference in Tennessee's series opening loss at, at uh, Missouri last year and Tennessee's series opening loss at Alabama this year, obviously Tennessee was swept by the Tigers last year. Tennessee... Uh, had a huge win in game one against Alabama and on Friday night and then lost uh, games two and game three. I think Tennessee just got punched in the face against Missouri last year. I mean, they just got their brains kicked in, you know? This year, I felt like Tennessee, and again, no disrespect to Alabama because Alabama did some good things. I feel like Tennessee beat Tennessee. You know what I'm saying? Like, Tennessee won on Friday. In, in game two, Drew Beam could not find a third out in those disastrous second and third innings. Christian Moore made a couple of boneheaded mistakes uh, in the field and, and then one on, on the base pass or one boneheaded mistake, I guess. Luke will caught an error and a half here in a moment. I would kind of agree with that. Um, Tennessee couldn't hit with runners in scoring position, both on Saturday and Sunday. Um, again, take, take no, take nothing away from Alabama because they went out there and won that game and Gage Miller hit that home run on Sunday. But fact of the matter is I feel like Tennessee got in Tennessee's own way over the weekend. So those things are correctable in my opinion. Um, what you need to be working through and what you need to be, you know, trying to find a solution for is that bullpen. And that's what we talked about in the 3 2 1 heading into SEC play. Who's going to step up? Who's got those defined roles? Because right now we don't know. Uh, Marcus Phillips has been a little bit up and down. Aaron Combs has been a little bit up and down. Chris Stamos has been injured. He's come back, and it was good to see him pitch a clean inning or two thirds of an inning on, on Tuesday. Um, AJ Cause is in the rotation. Nate Sneed is in the bullpen, but he's a, a long relief. And it looked like he was kind of holding back a little bit on Sunday because trying to preserve some energy to not be so gassed there towards the end. And, and again, I wrote about it. We talked about it. Who are you going to give the ball to in that situation? I don't know if Tennessee just has that answer right now. Whereas if Causey was in the bullpen, boy, what a time to bring in AJ Causey in that situation to go up against Gage Miller with a funky delivery. Um, late in that ball game with the game on the line. Shoulda, coulda, woulda. It, it is what it is, and Tennessee's got to find a way to work through it, and this weekend's going to be a big part of that. I, I do not know why these freshmen have not been throwing more. Matthew Dallas got in there at the very end on Tuesday, and I think that was good. I mean, his numbers, he's walked a lot this year, don't get me wrong, but um, he's not given up any runs to date. Schaefer has been a little bit more shaky and haven't seen him in a while. I, I get it. You don't want to – I mean, if they're not ready, they're not ready – but your bullpen needs some depth and your bullpen needs some options. 
And so these freshmen, by Matthew Dallas and, and, and Derek Schaefer, and we know about Loy. They've used Loy a lot. We'll see if they use him in the SEC series this weekend. They've got a pitch for you. They've got to be readily available, in my opinion. So uh, we'll see if Tennessee can kind of continue to work through that. At the end of the day, it is a marathon. It is not a sprint. This is not football. When you lose a game in football, it's a big deal because you have only 12 of those opportunities. You lose a game in baseball, you have you have 30 more. You know what I'm saying? Now, you want to win series. Series win, series win, series win, series win. You'd like to have a couple sweeps in there for sure. But if you continue to win series, then you're going to be a pretty good ball team. And, um, you know, Tennessee should be in a good position to do that against Ole Miss this weekend. All right, uh, let's talk about some of these injuries. A.J. Russell came back, pitched 40 uh, pitches, two innings. If not for his own balk call, he might have got out of that two-inning return at Alabama without allowing a run. But I thought he was fine. Good to get him back out there. Um, Tony Vitello did not name a starter for th- for Sunday's game. Again, going with A.J. Causing on Friday and Drew Beam on Saturday. And, and the belief is it's going to be A.J. Russell again getting the start on Sunday and continuing to stretch out. I think he needs to throw about 60, 65 pitches this week in my opinion, as he continues to stretch out. Now, you don't name him as the starter because if you're in a tight spot like you were Sunday, late in that Sunday ball game in Alabama, and you're trying to come on and win a baseball game, you'll have A.J. Russell at your disposal to turn to if needed. And I think that's good. But also, he needs to stretch out. He has got to stretch out because he has got to get back in the rotation for you full time. And so I think it'd be in Tennessee's best interest to go ahead and start him on Sunday and get, let him go about you know 60 to 65 pitches. And we'll see. And I think that's what's going to happen. But you never want to show all your cards before they're dealt. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's kind of what Tony Vitell is doing here, knowing that he's got that option. He's got that ace in his back pockets, literally, if you want to throw him out there late in a Friday, late in a Saturday game. But I think it's in the best interest for Tennessee if A.J. Russell pitches 65 pitches on Sunday. So um, I think that's what's going to happen. We'll see exactly. I mean, of course, if he's you know not getting rocked. Uh, We'll see exactly how that uh, transpires. Marcus Phillips exited Tuesday's game and uh, in conversations with some people and talking to some people throughout the week, think that uh, he's going to be okay, nothing long-term, but I doubt that he uh, will be available this weekend. Um, It's it's day by day, but I would assume that he's probably not going to be available this weekend. So there's another right-hander that has arguably the best stuff on your roster. Hasn't transpired yet, but you might not even have that option this weekend. So... That's kind of the update there. Dalton Bargo, I was told Sunday of last weekend that he's going to be okay. It's a mild strain, minor strain in your hamstring, but with a hamstring injury, if you rush it back, you're going to you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to try to take one step forward, you might take two or three or four steps back. And so, you got to be careful with a hamstring. Um, I think he was available to pinch hit on Sunday. He was available to pinch hit on Tuesday. I think he'll be available to pinch hit on you know this weekend. It's just I don't think they want him running the bases right now, and he certainly won't be playing the outfield this weekend. So he might not play at all, but I do believe if they have a need for a pinch hitter that he would be available. So you know playing that slowly back as well. And then Ariel Antigua came back, and he's been getting a little bit of defensive runs in the ninth inning the last couple of weeks. He got his first at bat in the midweek and nearly went yard twice, if not for the wind. Um, so that's something to be paying attention to. They love Ariel Antigua. Ariel Antigua was a prospect coming in this summer, uh, coming into Tennessee. Um, He was the leader in the clubhouse leaving fall. Uh, He's a guy that they love his defense, okay, and they think that he can be a pretty stout hitter, and he's got a lot of confidence. Um, Look for him to potentially be mixed in the rotation a little bit. What does that look like? Maybe Dean Curley gets the day off. Maybe Dean Curley can go to DH. I don't know. It gives you some options, but with Ariel Antigua picking up a bat and, and having his first career AB the other night, Looks like he's ready to roll. And so, um, you know, we'll see exactly how they want to implement him. I mean, Dean Curley shouldn't lose his job, in my opinion. He's done a fine job. And he's done, I know that he started off super, super, super hot, but he's done a fine job overall playing defense and hitting towards the bottom of the order. Um, but it's great to have that option of Ariel Antigua that you can roll in there and change it up from time to time. And if something happens to Curley, whether he slumps or gets hurt, uh, you, you got somebody in your pack pocket that was probably going to be your, your number one option all year long anyway. So, uh, that was good to see him get back there and get his first at bat on Tuesday. Uh, let's look at, well, before we get into Ole Miss, something to be on the lookout for this week will obviously be this week and obviously be History Watch. Blake Burke is now two home runs shy of the man that's about to speak here in a matter of moments, Luke Lipsius, for the career record in home runs for the Tennessee baseball program. Blake Burke now has 38 career home runs. 
Luke Lipsius is the leader at 40 career home runs. Of course, Lipsius, he tied and overtook his teammate Evan Russell back in the 2022 season. I think they both hit home runs in the fifth inning against Notre Dame and game two or game three, I can't remember. Regardless, it's Lipsius at 40 home runs, Evan Russell at 39 home runs, and some guy by the name of Todd Helton. Oh yeah, Hall of Famer Todd Helton with 38 career home runs. Blake Burke has tied Todd Helton with 38 career home runs, and not to be forgotten, Christian Moore is lurking around at 34 home runs. He's six away from tying the, the program record right now, so He'll be getting pretty close by the time the season's over with, in my opinion. He has a chance to surpass Lipsius as well, but will he catch Burke, who has a four-home run head start? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see, but this is something to track certainly this weekend as uh, Burke is just now two away, and uh, we'll continue to track that this weekend and all week, all year long. All right, let's take a look at Ole Miss, shall we? Ole Miss is a team that won the 2022 National Championship. It was a disastrous season before then. Not disastrous, but it was not a great season before then. 14-16 um, and 16 record in, in SEC play, that's good enough to get you in, don't get me wrong, but they were on the bubble a little bit. And you know their, their skipper was probably going to be canned. But then you get in, you go on a run, you play your best baseball late, and that's what Ole Miss did in 2022 and claimed a national championship, taking down, I believe, yeah, it was Oklahoma in the College World Series final. Now, trying to defend that title was just horrendous play. 25-29 uh, and 29 the overall record for Ole Miss last year, 6-24 and 24 in Southeastern Conference play. That is not getting it done whatsoever. So what does Ole Miss do? They hit the transfer portal. Just like in football, the baseball team hit the transfer portal and built this team, these, these starters specifically, um, getting a – Getting more than a handful of some impact starters to come in via the transfer portal. Um, what's that look like? I'll tell you here in a moment. Ole Miss, preseason pick six in the SEC West and um, had nobody named to the preseason all SEC squads, but of course did take down South Carolina last weekend and is a fresh off a Tuesday victory over number 25 Southern Miss um, on the road on Tuesday. So again, much like Alabama, Ole Miss just got done playing Southern Miss. Tennessee needs some better competition in the midweeks, in my opinion, and in non-conference play. Um, so Ole Miss coming to town, and the rotation for Ole Miss has taken a beating so far this year. Uh, you've had JT Quinn, who was the opening day starter. Um, he's been dealing with blisters on his throwing hand, and then he strained his oblique last week when he was actually in the bullpen. Uh, point is, he's been dealing with injuries for a while. Now he's going to be out indefinitely. Hunter Elliott is still recovering from Tommy John surgery that he had in May of last season. So is Xavier Rivas. Uh, Right-handed pitcher Riley Maddox has been pretty solid in the midweek, but um, th this rotation right now is relying on a junior college standout, a former junior college standout, and a transfer from Coastal Carolina. The former JUCO guy is Gunnar Dennis. Started as the Saturday guy, has emerged now the Friday night starter. Formerly of uh, Meriden Community College, he's 3-0 on the season and five starts, a 456 ERA, 23 innings and two-thirds, struck out 29, walked 11, and has allowed 12 earned runs over 25 surrendered. Liam Doyle is a lefty, another lefty, and he'll pitch on Saturday, so Tennessee's going to see back-to-back -back lefties. Uh, shifted the rotation after beginning the campaign in the Ole Miss bullpen. He started each of the past two Saturdays. He's got a 2-0 record, six appearances, ERA of 395. The former Chanticleer has totaled 13 and two-thirds innings pitched on the mound, 27 strikeouts to four walks. It's pretty good. The Sunday starter, it's already been announced for Ole Miss, is going to be a righty by the name of Grayson Saunier. Um, he's been the Sunday guy all year long. He's compiled a three and two record, a four oh nine ERA, twenty two innings and a third, seventeen Ks, nine walks. He's allowed ten earned runs off twenty one hits. Opponents are hitting two forty seven against him. So, so there, there's some opportunity there. Get this, closer Connor Spence. His numbers look atrocious. On the season, he has a seven point seven one ERA in seven appearances. But really, it's just because of one horrendous outing. Um, it was against Iowa back on March the 1st. He surrendered six earned runs off three hits and a walk in just one-third of an inning. But outside of that, his six other appearances on the season, he's not allowed to run. He's gave up just three hits, walked one, 
and pitch six and two thirds innings. So one bad outing is why that that ERA is inflated. And that was all the way back on March the first. So he's pretty good. He's leading the team with four saves. Um, he's been around a little bit, formerly of Southeastern Louisiana. Before that, he played Juco ball in Northwest Mississippi and Mississippi Gulf Coast. His first year with Ole Miss, again, don't let that ERA shock you. It was one bad outing. He's been pretty pretty stout the, the rest of the way. So that that's kind of a look at the uh, at the arms for Ole Miss. They're missing a lot. It's It's been tough sledding for the starting pitchers overall, but they've settled into a group with Gunnar Dennis, a lefty, Liam Doyle, a lefty, and then Grayson Sauner, a righty in that order, and that's what Tennessee is going to face um, this weekend. Quick look at the bats, shall we? Oh, real quick, overall team ERA is at 388. You've got the bats who have compiled to hit 280 on the season, 31 of 34 stolen base attempts. So be on the lookout. When Ole Miss is on the base path, they're going to go, and specifically I'll tell you who's going to go in a moment. Left fielder, cleanup hitter Ethan Lege, I guess that's how you say his name. I don't know. 384 hitter. Team high, 28 hits, 5 doubles, 25 RBI. He's a senior. He's second in home runs on the team with six. He's only struck out t- uh, five times this year, which is really impressive. Uh, formerly of Florida Atlantic, um, Jackson Ross is the first baseman. He's second on the team with a 347 clip on the season. Uh, first baseman, he's homered five times, drove in 24 runs, stolen four bases in four attempts. So that's one of the transfers. Uh, Duke transfer Andrew Fisher, 316 average, third baseman. Leads the team with 25 RBI, nine home runs. So that's a transfer. Fifth-year senior Ethan Groff, he hits leadoff, hitting 313 on the year, four home runs, 12 ribbies. Team high, eight stolen bases on eight attempts. So he's a guy to be on the lookout for. Uh, Transfer from Mercer, right fielder, Trayson Hughes. Sitting a respectable 279. Arizona State transfer. We remember this name, right? Luke Hill. Struggling at the plate. 233 hitter so far. However, he too, he too has stolen eight of eight, eight bags on eight attempts this season. So uh, again, those are some of the highlighted players. Transfers again comprise this team. Jackson Ross of Florida Atlantic, Andrew Fisher of Duke, Trayson Hughes of Mercer, Luke Hill of Arizona State. Um, Ethan Le- Lege leads the team uh, with an average of 384. You've got a highly touted freshman, Campbell Smithwick, behind the plate, but he really hadn't caught fire either, as has Eli Birch, who kind of split the catching duties. Um, and, and that's kind of what they look like in the in the order. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a solid baseball team. Still trying to figure themselves out. kind of in survival mode a little bit on the mound, but they've kind of they found their three guys here of late. Um, a lineup's got some pop, can do some damage. Tennessee's going to have to locate for sure, and Tennessee is going to have to manage base runners well this weekend for sure. 31 of 38 stolen base attempts uh, for Ole Miss, and it's Ethan Groff, who's 8 for 8 in stolen bags, and Luke Hill, who is 8 for 8 in stolen base attempts on the season as well. Uh, what does Luke Lipsius think about the Ole Miss series coming up? What did he think about the Alabama series uh, that happened last weekend? What does he think about Blake Burke, who's about to overtake his record in terms of being the home run king? I'll say all that here in a, a moment when we return here on Locked On Ball, uh, here on uh, the porch. Sorry, too many podcasts. Here on the porch, brought to you by our friends Spivey King and Spivey LLP. Really couldn't do this without my friends. And and I talk to Matt all the time. Such a good dude. Such a big Tennessee Vol fan. And uh, they're just guys like us. And uh, they can help you, though, if you have a need in the future. you got a problem, let them find a solution for you. That is TN Trial Lawyers. They specialize in things such as criminal offense, family law, personal injuries, examples of which can be DUI, homicide, assault, divorce, custody, alimony, parental rights, Personal injuries, car wrecks, accidents, stuff like that. They got over 80 years of combined experience, Bobby King and Bobby LLP. They can provide representation throughout state and federal courts in Northeast Tennessee. The firm has a vast amount of trial experience. This practice has been in place for 43 years, this specific partnership since 2012. Uh, and they have partners who are energized for today's modern legal demands. Practicing primarily in Northeast Tennessee, the Tri Cities of Sullivan County, as well as Hawkins County, Washington County, and surrounding areas. The firm has won multiple awards, have attorneys who have been rated by super lawyers in the Mid South with real trial experience. Whether you've been injured in a car accident, need a divorce, help with custody of your children or have been accused of a crime spivey king and spivey lop is here to help you go see him in person today at 142 cherokee street in kingsport tennessee pick up the phone 
and dial this number for a free consultation. That's also, if you're watching on YouTube or on, on the website right now, it's, it's also in the bottom ticker. That number is 423-245-4185 for a free consultation or go online. It's Bobby King and Spivey, LLP.com. It's Bobby King and Spivey, LLP.com. You got a problem, let them find a solution for you. TN Trial Lawyers. And, and real quick, before we get into Luke, I do want to remind you guys as well, Baseball season this weekend, or baseball, huge SEC series against Tennessee and Ole Miss. But it's also March Madness. Tennessee basketball is in full effect. They're playing late, late, late tonight on Thursday against St. Peter's. And gosh, they better be playing on Saturday as well. But not just Tennessee basketball. It's all the March Madness. And if you need to sneak in those tournament games tomorrow at work, Prime Video has got you covered. Watch every game live on your phone, on your laptop, or relax and watch it at home on Prime Video with a subscription. Prime Video gives you choices to add on channels like Paramount Plus, Max, both featuring NCAA tournament games, all in one place. It's March, it's madness. Stream it all today on Prime Video. Luke Lipsius coming up next as we continue on with the porch. Luke, not the start in SEC play uh, that Tennessee obviously wanted, that, that fans wanted. Um, but again, it's not the end of the world. We'll get into that here in a moment. But what were some of the overarching themes that you picked up? Uh, Tennessee to Alabama, a two to one series loss. Yeah, you know, you come out on Friday and you play such clean baseball offense and defense, and it sets the tone. So um, coming out of the gates with a, such a strong win like that, you'd think that it would carry over into the next few games. But what we saw was a complete reversal that next game the only person who really seemed like to have a, a good good game was was Christian Moore um I thought I didn't think Beam pitched bad per se I thought they just had some timely hits and also um a lot of just hits through the infield you know you can't really be mad um we did make a couple of errors and then um they had a couple more hits and a couple big hits but you know it was that game it was it was just not a lot of offense again we had runners in scoring position i think we left nine on base throughout the whole game of course that stat's a weird one because it doesn't tell you the situation even so um there was instances where we could have scored that we didn't and then we get to that sunday game um we get out fairly big in an sec series you know it was, it was a four to one lead at one point they keep mm -hmm. chipping away chipping away um eventually it's a five uh five or four four ball game we score a run thinking we're we're back in the driver's seat and then of course they had that that big three run bomb that you know that it deflates the the sale so it's not the worst thing of course it's the first sec weekend that bama team is really talented i would expect to see them in a regional this year for sure yeah. um but of course you you got to be disappointed especially coming out as we did on friday and knowing what we have um you know, it's we, we got guys that that showed flares of brilliance. You know, Burke's been looking as confident that I've ever seen him. Amick is, of course, doing what he's doing. Simo doing what he's doing. Tears is, is cooled down a little bit. I'm sure he's going to pick it back up. Um, so, like I said, there's a lot of good stuff. But, you know, disappointing overall to start out one and two. But it's better than last year. I think we, we got swept our first series. So, you know, it, anything can happen. I think we'll be just fine going uh, moving forward. Yeah, the way I kind of looked at these series, and I said that on a radio hit earlier this week, like last year you went on the road and you got you got punched in the face, you know, getting swept. This year it's almost like Tennessee, and I'm not trying to take anything away from Alabama because like you said, I think it's a talented team, but it's almost like Tennessee was just punching Tennessee in its own face, right? I mean, it just couldn't get out of its own way. Tennessee mm -hmm. could have swept this series, in my opinion. Even Saturday – um, I'm not a big moral victory guy, but I mean, I just tip my cap to the way that they net, they just, they just kept clawing. They just kept clawing and, and beam. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we know what beams all about, but I mean, that was just the epitome of beam the other night, clearly not his best stuff. Could not find out number three in those, in that second and third inning, but they just came back, retired like 15 of his last 17, 13 straight, saved the bullpen and Tennessee again, brought the tying run, I believe to the plate once uh, late in that ball game. I felt like, mm -hmm. sure, you're right. It's disappointing. The results are kind of suckish, but a lot that you can maybe learn moving forward from from that weekend series loss. Oh, 100 percent. And you know, I'm I'm saying disappointing as a fan. I know V's going yeah. back in the the coach's office telling the team like we learned a lot or have a lot to learn from this weekend. Like you said, when you fail, especially early on, it's a lot better because you know I've I've said it before. You never want to be hitting your stride too early into the season um if you look too good early something is bound to happen um so like you said not bad i will say what beam did on saturday 
<laughs> makes me even more mad that we lost on Sunday because we legitimately yeah. have a full bullpen. Like there was no reason for you to not just empty the tank. Everyone was fresh. So that again, as a as a as a fan, as a person who knows that that off or that staff and everything, a little bit disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so I, I mean like you said good stuff to learn from um but again i i, I just wanted more you know i wanted more out of that out of the first series especially that sunday game yeah no doubt and uh, you know a lot of people were frustrated with tony vitello frank anderson because they didn't take nate sneed out of the ball game a, a batter too early i mean look back at the notre dame you know loss and supers a couple years ago with mm -hmm. uh, your team i mean it's easy to say oh you should have done this should have done this but my question for you is and th this is kind of me after the game and when i was writing my monday column you're still at a point and I, I know it's early but you're still at a point to where you're just like i don't know who i could go to in that situation it was gage miller one of the better righties maybe aaron combs because he's got kind of that funky uh delivery but he was okay when he pitched on Friday. You didn't necessarily want to go to a lefty in that situation, but Stamos had already pitched in that ball game. Uh, Binky had pitched on Friday. I'm not saying he couldn't. Um, Matthew Dallas hadn't seen a lot of him here lately. I mean, Kirby eventually came in, but do you want to go to Kirby in that situation? Uh, my, my point is we can go down the, the, the list here. I'm not saying it was the wrong decision to, to leave him in or not to pull him or whatever, but it's almost like you just didn't have a, a, a guy that's like, okay, let's go in, let's, let's let's get him out, instead of just rolling the dice with Snead still in there. How would you have maybe managed that that eighth inning when Gage Miller hit that three-run home run and they, they took the lead for good on Sunday? You know, it's something like that is so tough because, like you said, hindsight is 2020. Um, and again, just like that 2022 Notre Dame game, you got a guy that's that's pretty much rolling. You know, he gave up a few runs, but for the most part, doing well. Um, and then, of course, you know, you you let a couple of guys on. Usually, when that second guy gets on, is when you need to yank him. Yeah. Because I mean, just knowing baseball, it's like first guy gets on, you're like, all right, let's see if you can get this guy out. Second guy gets on, you're like, yank him. But like you said. What are we going to do in a righty righty matchup right we got the lefty lefties covered for the most part but this is where it becomes like what we've been talking about all season what do we do with causey russell beam sneed what do we do because we want a causey type arm in the bullpen yep. but you know i'm gonna kind of jump forward to probably what we were going to talk about he's going to stay in that friday role until you know we stop or we stop winning he's just doing so well so like you said um I, I also think that the roles that we've been that we put been putting Snead in early on in the season has not helped him up to this point because last weekend was really his first weekend of getting, you know, valuable innings, we'll call them, you know, not those midweek innings, but that actual um, weekend long relief appearances. And, you know, he, he looked great, but. You know, in in hindsight, we should have pulled him. But again, yeah. like who, who do we put in? We're gonna we can roll the dice with Kirby, who it, he is a veteran. But again, like you want that guy in Causey or Russell or whoever you you bring him in. You know, he's gonna get now. Um, so I I think that they're gonna they're gonna dabble with stuff, especially now with Russell coming back, uh, mixing and matching. I I would still expect to see Causey in that Friday roll, but you know you never know. You never know. Yeah, it's it's um it's gonna be Causey on Friday. It's gonna be Beam on Saturday. Tony said TBD on Sunday. Mm -hmm. If if it's a close game on Friday Saturday, I could see Russell coming in to maybe mm -hmm. pitch an inning or two. But again, he needs to. I was talking about this on Tuesday night. Like he needs to throw sixty five pitches in my opinion this weekend. Like they need to continue to get him out. So in yep. my opinion, he's gonna be rolling out there on Sunday to start again. But of course, we'll keep tabs on it. Uh, Marcus Phillips, another one of those names. But I mean, he's kind of been. I mean, injury right now, but he's kind of been up and down as well. And I, again, there's, it's early in the season. You just didn't have a clear cut go to direction, and it's unfortunate because Snead is a guy that you would bring in in that situation. Mm -hmm. You know, throwing pump in ninety nine, um, you know, just hard thrower, huge, huge part of the game. And so, I don't know. We'll have to see exactly how it works out. Um, I want to talk about your guy Blake Burke, man? Mm -hmm. He's uh, he's on a tear. Um, he's playing good defense. He's on a twelve game hitting streak right now. He is two home runs away from tying you for the career uh, home run marker in, the, in, in Tennessee history. Um, 
he's playing really good baseball, and it's just good to see because he's such a good baseball player. Last year was hard to watch, and it's early. Hopefully, he keeps it up, but last year was hard to watch. Good to see him swinging the bat and, like you said earlier, being confident right now. Yeah, no, he uh, what he's doing at the plate is unbelievable. Not even just, like, the production, but how he looks. So earlier in the season, you know, he looks sped up. He looks like he's diving at, diving at balls. He looks not him. Right now, this is Blake Burke that we've been waiting for. You know, last season, like you said, um, definitely not him as well. This is what we came to expect out of him. And, you know, it's one of those things where I'm sad. Yeah, I won't have a record anymore. Honestly, it needs to be broken anyways because, you know, you got guys like Fabian hitting 40 in two years, you know. So it's, it's one of those things where his record's going to stand the test of time. Either way, <clears throat> Burke is, is proving himself to be one of the, the powerful forces in the SEC that now we have in the two hole, we can rely on him. Um, and it, it gives Amit cover. It, it gives Simo um, uh, cover. Like it, it's just so good. And the offense is going to work so well when Burke is doing what he's doing right now. What's been different about him? I know you kind of went into it a little bit there, but like, what is he doing differently at the plate? I mean, he's a doubles machine right now. It feels like he ropes one down the right field line at least once a game. And he's, he was, um, I'll have to go back and look, but he was among one of the nation leaders in doubles there mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Um, what what adjustments has he made that you've been able to pick up on? So, yeah, he's he's third in the nation right now in doubles, which okay. that, anytime, anytime you're top five in anything in the nation, really cool. Um, but, you know, I mean, mechanically, we can get into it. He's just a lot more balanced. Um, he's always had a swing that kind of sways forward, but now he's like swaying and staying back at the same time, if that makes sense. But he just – the timing is there, and the, the relaxation is there. The swings aren't too big. You can tell if a guy is going good when it doesn't look like they're swinging hard. Like all of his homers this, thus far, um, all of his doubles that he's hitting, he is literally doing his thing, flicking the bat like he can, and it's going over. It's, it's being hit super hard. Um, that's how you know he's going well. So it's a, a big switch from the beginning – of the year where you saw him kind of er, muscling up, timing was off, diving towards the blah, 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 all this bad stuff. You see not as, as firm contact. Um, you know, he still gets into one every, every once in a while, but now it's, it's a lot more consistent. I am loving what I'm seeing out of Burke. Let's go back to that game two when Tennessee lost uh, six to three. We're down six to nothing at one point in time, had the tying run there in the ninth inning. Um, Christian Moore, had probably one of the most unique games I've ever seen. Offensively, he started four for four, finished four or mm -hmm. five, had a home run, drove in a run. Um, he looked really good. Uh, defensively, he had an error that that ultimately cost it a run. I think he had a defensive play where you can't call it an error because it was, and it was a play well to his right. He made he did the hard part, made the stop, but just couldn't couldn't get a grasp on the baseball to throw him out of first base, and then that inning kind of spiraled after that. Um, he had a base running mistake. Let me ask you this real quick sidebar. I don't want to get you in trouble or anything, but is there a philosophy with Tennessee baseball where you just run? Because I feel like the, the rule is if the ball sit in front of you, you stop. But like SEMO did at that time, and then, of course, you saw it in the midweek game as well, and you've seen it in years past. So I was holding in screams when <laughs> – I don't. I think it was just one that game, but then the very next game we did the same thing. Unless it was two that game, I can't remember. I remember two instances. One of them was Robin, and the other one was Simo, yeah. where 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 balls hit to your right at second. You go back. You go back. That's you like you practice it every single day. Um, I am sure V and E are wearing them out this week on that specific instance because no, you should you shouldn't go. Um, the only time you're on like all run, of course, two outs, but then also there's a contact play where you're on third, where if a ball is hit on the ground, then you start running, blah, blah, blah. I guess they thought they were on contact. I don't know. But needless to say, those two blunders are not only just getting you out of better position on the base pass, but they almost deflate the offense. You know, yeah. when you see that happen, it's like crap. Like we're making stupid mistakes. Because that whole team knows that's what it is. It's a stupid mistake. But, yeah, no, that we don't get taught to run into outs. I promise you that. <laughs> I didn't think so. But, like, it's just, sometimes it's, just, it's so puzzling. Um, I don't know if you watched the Tuesday game. And if you didn't, I'm putting you on the spot. But Dean Curley was at third. Infield was in. Ball was hit to third. He mm -hmm. takes off. It's yep. like, what are you doing? But, yeah, I mean, he got in a pickle and he ended up scoring. So, that's, that's the contact play. Whenever okay. there is um, – one out or you know two outs is obvious whenever there's one out it's a contact play it's basically you start running 
you make them the defense make a play, which you know it ended up working out. That runner on first goes to second, so that way it's still two outs, runner in scoring position either way, you know. Um, but like you said, the reason why we do it is for plays like that. When the error happens, when an errant throw happens, you end up getting a run out of it instead of just you know a, a runner on third with two outs, which is the same as runner on second with two outs. Yeah, I mean, I I, I get the thought process of, of making them make a play. I get that. Still, it's it's sometimes tough, but it did work out the other day on Tuesday. So to your point, it did work out. Back to Christian Moore, fantastic game on Tuesday. I really like him in the leadoff spot. He's you know he's not getting as many hits. He's still hitting a great average, but maybe not getting as many hits as he would in the heart of the order. But he's he's giving good at bats. He's taking. He's being patient, like what a leadoff hitter should be. It was four for five in that Tuesday game, but defensively in other areas of the game, it was kind of a bad game. So as a player, I'm sure you've had games like that before. How do you kind of view your performance after a, play, a, a game like that where you did a lot good, but you also made a couple of mistakes that, that kind of hurt your team? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> the good ones will still be mad. Um, and so I, I think Simo would be mad because he is a, he's yeah. a competitor, he's a gamer. So he's not so much going to look at his four for five day with the homer. He's going to say, you know, I – made those two you know errors one error and a half um that cost us a few runs that could have been the difference and as a player you got to shake that off because you know you have another game the next day um especially against a really good team so you're going to be able to make more plays so the the best will be mad at themselves but also know hey this is what i did what i could have done better blah 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 learn from it and do better the next day he's fun to watch man him and burke of course beam and, and billy i mean the Dryling, maybe Tennessee's going to have a lot of a lot of early names called oh, this yeah. summer. No, it's it's not, it's and that's why nobody's worried because yeah. of the the guys we got are going to be just fine. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, Want to ask you get your thoughts on uh, real quick AJ Russell? It was brief, forty pitches, kind of a longer bottom or top of the uh, third inning. Thought he might come back out for the third, uh, but ultimately two innings, forty pitches, 28, 29 strikes, something like that. Um, if not for a balk, uh, his balk in the first inning, he would have probably pitched a spotless uh, two innings of work. But uh, I had to start somewhere. What do you think about AJ Russell on Sunday? Yeah, I, th I thought it looked good. He didn't look to look to his um, you know opening weekend uh, self or even even the next one. But you know, it's it's what happens when you come back from an injury, especially what he has. He's going to have to learn to trust his. I, th I think it was back or oblique or something. Um, which is, you know, one of the worst places to get as a baseball player just because it's we're so rotationally focused. Yeah. Um, I think once he gets full confidence in his in his body that he can do what he can do, we're gonna see that velo tick up. Um, what's really good to see is how many strikes he's throwing because we know that he's gonna have the speed at some point. Um, but if he's throwing strikes, like he's gonna be so good. And and and, and again, I thought it was a, a good outing, especially for a comeback one. I would have liked to see you know, three innings of work. Um, but again, he's going to be on that pitch count. So it is what it is. Like you said earlier, they got to start run, running them up there, um, get them back up to, to speed. So um, this weekend will be extremely interesting with a, with a good Ole Miss ball club coming into town, you know, and it's uh, it, it'll be super fun to see how packed Lindsey Nelson gets um, for their first SEC weekend this year. Yeah, kind of on that note, let's look at Ole Miss. I don't expect you to be, uh, you know, you're, you're on that Ole Miss, you know, beat staff, so you don't know every single player. But this is a team that was not good in 2022, mm -hmm. was going to fire their coach, goes on a run, kind of like what Tennessee did last year, goes on a run, gets, you know, starts winning games, and they they win the whole dang thing, um, which is really, really cool. They, they bounce, they don't bounce back. They come back in 2023 and have a horrendous season. Mm -hmm. Horrible year. Six and 24 in SEC play. This year, off to a pretty good start. They they took down South Carolina at home two to two to one. They got a sixteen and six record, comprised of a lot of teams like this, but comprised of a lot of transfers now in Ole Miss. You got Luke Hill over there at shortstop, Andrew Fisher at third, Jackson Ross at first. You have uh, Tryson Hughes in, in in the outfield. Um, they got a really talented young catcher. They got a fifth year senior in center field. Uh, they got some dogs in the rotation. Um, kind of, again, kind of a well rounded Ole Miss club. But what what have you? I don't know if you've seen them play at all. What do you know about Ole Miss? Yeah, so what I know, I mean, they're a like like they're just a good team. You know, they they don't do anything extremely well. They don't do anything extremely poorly. So maybe their their defense can can get up a little bit. I think they're feeling like a nine seventy clip or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but but like you said, those teams that are full of transfers are funky to see work because you don't know how everyone's gonna mesh, and so that that's what's gonna 
put take a good team to a great team or to a bad team. Um, I think I think this early in the season, um, we're we're seeing them do just fine. They got a, a few bruisers right there in the middle of the lineup. I know Fisher had three home runs in one game last weekend, which is uh, which is hard to do. So, I mean, they're they're doing well, but again, you know, their staffs a, a four ERA pretty good. So they're just a good team. Um, so from what I've seen, what I've heard from Ole Miss, you know, they're they're an SEC team. They're going to be coached well, and they're gonna they're gonna play well. And and nobody wants to come into an opposing team's place and lose. So they're, they're going to have a, a little extra gusto with them. Um, I expect to see a, a really good series this weekend. I think Tennessee's won 17 games straight at home, dating back to to the last midweek game last year. Um, I had it in my story the other night. Uh, but it was um, that series at, Ole, at uh, Ole Miss, that series at Alabama last weekend broke a couple of streaks. Of course, Tennessee's win streak. It was mm-hmm. the second longest to you guys from 2022. You guys won, was it 23 games? 22? 23, yes. 23. Tennessee won 18. Um, and, of course, that was, that was broke on Saturday. Uh, KT... He had an 18-game hit streak that was broke. It was snapped. Now Blake Burke has 12, and so we'll, we'll look to him. Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a time of the schedule. I feel like though, with all due respect to Ole Miss, because I, I think they're a pretty solid team, and with Georgia, and we know what you know Condone can do. He's such a player. These next two weekends, you need to start stacking up some dubs, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Like you need to go four and two will be fine. You need to go five and one, in my opinion, um, to to really kind of again get some wins in the bank because of what's coming down the pike in the sec schedule. Oh, 100%. And anytime you play an sec weekend, you never want to like think of it as a down weekend, but just like a season, you're going to have down teams you play against. You're going to have up teams you play against. You try to stay even keel, but it is impossible as a 19 to, you know, for me, 23 year old um, <laughs> to, to stay, to stay even keel. Tony says you're um, 40 though. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, he's, I think he said I'm like a, like 50, 40, 30, all, all the above um, <laughs> either way. So, but, but these weekends, I know they're going to be chomping at the bit for one, they lost last weekend, but then for two, they know what's ahead. They're smart players. They know that they got, uh, big, big teams, Florida Vanny doing really good. Um, like those guys that there's going to be a little bit more extra that they need to give. Um, so these are weekends that are are crucial. Um, and just to see how you bounce back from a series loss, um, just to see how you start maneuvering that bullpen. If people start filling into roles, um, I was going to mention, it seems like what they got going on on offense um, as far as the, the eight, uh, starters in the field too. They've, they've kind of settled into their roles. Everyone knows about when they're going to play, uh, which is nice to see this early on because uh, you, you compare it to a team like last year and they, they had no idea what was going on all the way until it seems like the super. <laughs> but, but so um, I lost my train of thought, but either, either way. Yeah. It's uh it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. <laughs> last thing I want to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to keep you over time real quick for one more question. Um, I was talking about this with, with, Brent, my boss, and um, I want to get your thoughts on this because you played in this program and this this schedule that Tony and Frank put together and Josh. Should Tennessee have a better non-conference schedule? Like, I get non-conference because, I mean, you know what's coming up. It's the SEC. It's going to be tough. However, outside of that opening weekend or, you know, uh, one of those tournaments you guys go to or showcases, it, it's a lot of run rules, it's a lot of gimmies, and it's a lot of let, let's just play everybody, which is good, but also – because of the lack of competition, maybe it puts you in a bind like it did on Sunday when it's like, okay, who do I give the ball to right now? Like, I, I, I don't know. Because you had not really been tested. Does that make sense? Should should the scheduling get a little tougher, at least, you know, for a weekend here or there before SEC schedule? So I've had this, de- not debate, talk, and more like a, a yelling match with a bunch of my buddies because, yes, I get so frustrated when you have these – not as good teams on your schedule when you got Louisville, when you got the Carolinas, when you got some Georgia teams right there within driving distance for a midweek or a weekend series. Why aren't we playing a series against Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech against, you know, NC State or whatever? These these teams aren't that far. Put them in in our our pre-conference schedule. Put them in in a midweek. um, And I think you would see a little bit better – play out of us because like you said it's so easy to sandbag a midweek because you're going to go out there you're going to try to get your hits you're going to try to get off the field that's i mean we're going to call all it is what it is you're trying to play six innings and you're going to sit your sit your butt on the bench 
that's not good when you got a, a team like a Florida or like a Vandy coming up, you know, and, and you got to lock back in. You'd rather stay locked in because it's it's easier to to stay locked in than to get locked in. So yes, I've 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 always thought that they need to put in stronger midweeks um, just to to make just better baseball too. It's better for for Tuesday TV watching, anyways. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. And again, I don't make the schedule. Maybe, um, maybe it's tough. Maybe nobody wants to play Tennessee, which is understandable. But also, you look at, you know, Florida, who they're playing in the midweek, and, and some of these other teams. I feel like it can be done. Mm-hmm. Anyway, good stuff, Luke. Always appreciate it, man. And uh, hopefully, Tennessee bounces back. We got some more uh, good things to talk about next week. Yes, hopefully. Great stuff there, as always, from my friend Luke Lipsius, former Tennessee first baseman, home run champion, uh, always giving a unique perspective, a player's perspective. Uh, from a guy that's been in this locker room, been coached by these coaches, and of course have played in this league. He's played Ole Miss as well, and uh, I think he's jacked up and ready to see what Tennessee can be all about this weekend over at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Tennessee and Ole Miss, Friday night at 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 6.30. I've got the schedule right here. Why don't I just look and make sure? This Friday, tomorrow, 6.30, Friday night, Saturday at 6 o'clock, and Sunday at 1 o'clock. Every game is going to be streamed on the SEC Network Plus, and you can listen on the Sports Animal whenever basketball is not happening and at utsports.com. Guys, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining me here on the porch. Big thank you to our friend Spivey King and Spivey LLP uh, for making all of this possible here on the porch for the second straight season. We'll do it again next Thursday, but before that, we got to see how Tennessee fares against Ole Miss. Here's for the sweep this weekend, Tennessee and Tony Vitello and the boys. Appreciate you guys here for listening and watching us on the porch.